Can you guys make a spot for me? Okay, thanks. What a great crowd of kids today. It's good to see you guys all here today. So what are all these things under the, under the cross? I almost said Christmas tree. <laughs> what are they? They're palms. They're palms. Yeah, I see there's some palms. What about the, the paper things? Where'd they come from? They came from the art room because we made them for Palm Sunday. You guys just made those this morning? Wow, that was a lot of work. They look more like palm trees, kind of, than our single little palms. They look pretty neat. I like those. Several years ago, I tried to make one. I was an abject failure. I didn't do well at all, but those look really nice. And you colored them, too, right? Yep, yep. Okay, well, thanks a lot for that. And they, uh, Hosanna, those of you who sang, you did a great job. Really good job. You know, Palm Sunday is one of my favorite Sundays, I think, because we've gone through this whole thing with Lent where, uh, you know, things are kind of quiet and maybe a little dark, and we think about giving things up and all that, and the music is kind of slow and sedate. And then Palm Sunday, boy, we let it all out. You know, we do Hosanna, and we make lots of noise, and we have lots of fun, and uh, I kind of enjoy that. And then, of course, if, we have, if we're having Palm Sunday, we know Easter's coming up, right? And we get all those fun things. We get to go out for the uh, Easter sunrise service and celebrate out there Jesus rising from the dead on Easter Sunday. So we get to go out and do that. And we get to watch the geese fly over when the sun comes up in the morning. That's always fun. But what we sometimes tend to forget is the days in between, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Because there are things that happened on every one of those days. And so Jesus went from this really glorious, you know, Hosanna day to being crucified before the glory of Easter Sunday. So we ought to remember those things too. How many of you are in discipleship class? Just a couple here today. Yeah, so in order to get points for discipleship class, you've got to go to those things, don't you? Yeah. Have you ever been to any of the Holy Week readings or to uh, Monday, Thursday service or anything before? No? Well, ah, good, good experience. And I would encourage all of you to come do it. If you don't, you're going to have to do it during your discipleship years. But uh, thanks for joining us today, and thanks for helping us to celebrate Jesus uh, coming into Jerusalem and, and his presence here in our church. And let's take a minute to pray before you leave. Gracious Lord, we, we cry Hosanna and... Uh, and we have a joyous Sunday as we celebrate your, your triumphant entry into Jerusalem and your triumphant entry into our lives and into our church. And we ask that uh, your presence always be here when we gather together to worship, that your spirit blesses us, that watches over these children, and blesses their families. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining me, and thanks for singing.
So after church last Sunday, I... There are two scripture readings this morning. The first from Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. The second reading is from Luke chapter 19, verses 28 through 48. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem, as he approached Bethpage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it, say, The Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead, they went and found it, just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Uh, generally, uh, Matt and I really coordinate these things well, but I have to confess that there is nothing in this sermon about armadillos. <laughs> I did, uh, I rescued this little book, Imitation of Christ is the title, from my parents' library sometime during my high school years, and uh, they in turn must have rescued it from my grandmother's library or maybe stolen it because it says on the inside cover that it was given to Hattie Griffith by her Sunday school teacher in 1894. I can't read the Sunday school teacher's name because the ink has faded so much. I, I tried several times during my life to read this little book all the way through, but I always found it was easier to just read it in small doses. And for years, I thought it was just an obscure little Christian devotional book until I got to college and I discovered that Thomas a. Kempis, the author, was a pretty famous guy. And not only that, but this little book is probably the best-selling, second best-selling to the Bible, Christian book of all times. Thomas was a monk who was dissatisfied with the worldliness of the church and what he saw as a lack of spirituality in the general public. So in the year 1427, he published this little book. It was immediately popular, and by 1650, it had already gone through 745 printings. Imitation of Christ influenced many Christian theologians, mystics, and authors down through the ages. And in the late 19th century, when my grandmother got this one, <laughs> 
you could probably find a copy in almost every Christian home. That's not true today. In fact, I think it would be safe to say that I might be the only one here today who owns a copy. And of course, I only hang on to it because it has historical significance and also because it has my grandmother's name in it. So what happened? Why did imitation of Christ suddenly lose favor? Perhaps the answer lies in what it is that we consider to be a life lived in imitation of Christ. Perhaps following the way of Jesus means something different to us today than it did back in 1427. Thomas Akempis thought that the way to imitate Christ was to found in a fully spiritual life. He believed that he and others needed to withdraw from the world and lead a totally contemplative life. He felt that was the only way to avoid sin and the many temptations of the world. And perhaps considering that, you know, the world around him then, which was just emerging from the dark ages, he might have had a good point. But today, Christians, for the most part, take a very different view of following Christ. Most believe we should not withdraw from the world to lead a spiritually pure life, but rather we should lead a moral and ethical life and engage with the world so as to spread the gospel. We seek to influence the world not so much by our piety as by our ethics, an ethic of generosity and honesty and love for all people. Our saints are not found hiding in monasteries, but rather they are out there serving the poor and the homeless, the persecuted, and the sick. You might call it the Mother Teresa model of Christianity. Now, the early Christians that the Apostle Paul wrote to in the case of our reading today, the people of Philippi, knew the gospel story just like we do. And they knew Jesus as a healer, a preacher, and one who reached out to the poor and the outcast. They heard this same story of Palm Sunday that we just read, even though it had not yet been written down in the Gospel of Luke. By all accounts, the Philippians were a good and a generous people. They believed what they had been told about Christ, and they had faith. But Paul, who was then in prison, probably in Rome, heard that they were struggling with how they should act, what they should do as Christians. This was a church that was mostly made up of Gentiles, people who had previously worshipped pagan gods. They didn't know about the Hebrew Bible and the Old Testament, and they were being introduced to this for the first time. And it confused them because it was full of rules and regulations some of them very ancient, which no one followed anymore, and some that were still being used by the Jewish people. And they wondered, shouldn't the followers of Jesus also have a set of rules to follow? They got tied up arguing over the mechanics of worship and the rules for righteous living. After all, they called themselves the people of the way, Shouldn't the way have some rules of the road, some signposts and some stop signs, street signs, directions? So Paul, in answer to their, their concerns, wrote a letter to encourage and to instruct the Philippians. The little part of it that we read here this morning is from chapter 2, and it's central to the entire letter. In fact, you could argue that it's central to the entire whole New Testament. Your attitude, Paul said, should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who though, although he was God, did not think equality with God was something to strive for. He was humble, he was a servant, and he was obedient even to death on the cross. Paul told the Philippians and us and Thomas Akempis to imitate Christ. Throughout the Bible and throughout life, God is revealed by what God does. This is especially true of the gospel. God is revealed by Jesus Christ's humility and sacrifice, and of course, most especially, by the resurrection 
on Easter morning. I think we, along with most people, when we think of God, we tend to think of God as this omnipotent and omniscient, all-powerful and all-knowing being. But in the gospel accounts, in the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord, God is primarily revealed as a God of grace. God loves and forgives and gives us eternal life. And so from Paul's letter, the people of Philippi understood that if they were to be followers of Christ, they too had to be people of grace. They too had to love and forgive and show others the path to eternal life. To imitate Christ didn't mean to withdraw from the world or to set up rules that somehow would separate them from the world, but rather to engage the world around them. And it is this understanding of following Jesus that was key to the spreading of Christianity around the world. Certainly there is much to be learned and felt and admired in Thomas Kempis's devotional book. And we shouldn't re neglect the spiritual and meditative aspects of Christianity. Perhaps we ought to dust off some of these old copies and take some time to meet God in quiet and reverential ways. But as important as these things are, there is more to Christianity than just worship and prayer. Paul, like Jesus before him, calls us to action. If we are to be Christians, followers of the way, then we also have to be people of grace. Jesus entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday with a fairly large group of followers who hailed him as a coming king. And he could have built this movement into some kind of political and religious following and tried to seize some of the, the power to rule in Jerusalem and Palestine. It had been done before several times. But he didn't do that because he was called by God to do something quite different something more important, and something much more lasting. Shortly after the triumphal entry, he was arrested, convicted of heresy and treason, tortured, and executed. Knowing this was to happen, he prayed earnestly to God to release him from this burden. He was so scared, we are told, that he sweated blood. And yet, Despite that, he went obediently to his death because it was in this way that God's will would be done and salvation would come to all people, even those who hated him. This is what grace is all about. So we too, each one of us, has a calling from God. We also are called to give and to sacrifice. Jesus said we are to take up our own cross most of those who followed Jesus into Jerusalem that day just disappeared as things fell apart. But we can't do that. We can't be satisfied with shouting hallelujah on Palm Sunday and then disappearing. We must be the ones who follow Jesus through the whole week. And then the ones who go and spread the story and who do good things. We are the ones called to heal to forgive, to provide shelter, to bring peace, to love one another, to be joyful at the resurrection, and to preach the good news. Throughout the centuries, the Christian church as a whole has not taken to heart the true significance of this passage in Philippians, even though we are quick to call it the word of God. Christians have reveled in the theological statement about the glory of God, and they have argued endlessly about what Paul says about the divine nature and the human nature of Christ. But they have largely ignored its implications for living. We are told to be humble, loving people, willing to serve and sacrifice. We are told to act gracefully. Besides all the theological stuff, this passage says to us, look, here is what God and what Jesus Christ is like. So knowing that, Work out for yourself what it means to you as a community and as individuals. 
A professor named Morna Hooker from Cambridge, England has said this much better than I. I took a little bit of liberty to paraphrase just slightly. But here's what she says about Philippians. Philippians in a nutshell. Christian obedience must be in response to God's grace rather than to a set of rules. Our response should be the same as that of Jesus Christ and his Holy Spirit will help us in that response. We are one in Christ, so our relationships in our community and in our families are very important. We should show love, selflessness, and concern for others. The result of this obedience will then be a powerful witness to others. Or, to put it in a simple sentence, what we believe is revealed in how we behave. Amen. Please stand for him.